You have tuned into The Voice of Medicine, the medical podcast filled with remarkable stories, first hand experience, important research, and valuable life lessons. Open your mind, relax, and enjoy. Dear ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another edition of The Voice of Medicine. My today's guest is a doctor, a consultant uh, in ophthalmology, who is um, simultaneously also a psychologist, but did not want to be a doctor to begin with. Um, I'm talking about Dr. Fatima Edma Joyce. Dr. Joyce is going to talk to me today about a couple of topics. We're going to talk about homeopathy and uh, why she believes that uh, homeopathy should be a part of medicine or medical treatment um, in general. We're going to talk about glaucoma. We're going to talk about why rubbing the eye is, um, I would say, a risk factor for eye health. And uh, we're going to talk about the infamous blue light and its uh, consequences for the, um, for, for the eye. By the end, I would also like to tackle the question of why she wrote the book that she wrote. Um, and I'll let her introduce uh, the topic of the book. The name of the book is also sort of um, intriguing, but I'll let her do the intro on that. Enjoy the talk. Hello to you, Michael. Thank you very much for inviting me to do this podcast with you. The pleasure is all mine. Thank you very much again. So, Dr. Joyce, unlike many doctors that I have spoke to um, previously, you are unique in the sense that you did not want to become a doctor at first and rather thought <laughs> of a, you know, of following the footsteps of your dad, who uh, was a lawyer. So what changed your mind? Why did you decide for medicine in the end? In the beginning, it was uh, my parents, really, who pushed me to uh, become a doctor. Actually, up to the time that I was being interviewed, you know, there was a panel of interviewers in the, in the university, and they asked me why he wants to become a doctor. And actually, I told them that it, I don't want to become a doctor. It's my parents who want me to become a doctor. So, um, so that's how uh, it ended up that they liked the, the way that I answered that question. I was very honest with them, and they see the spunk that was in me, I guess. So they accepted me in the in the College of Medicine. Well, it's funny. I mean, um, although your parents, you know, were, I mean, although they were successful um, dealing with law, they still wanted you to be um, a doctor. Usually what happens with parents is they, they somehow want to um, the, the kids to follow their footsteps, right? I mean, you have this, for example, if, uh, if uh, a father is a, a businessman and maybe has a company, they at least wish a lot for the fact that the kid would take over one day. Um, or, or, you know, that uh, they would they would go into the same field. But with you, it was different. They were pushing you to me towards medicine. But here you are being a doctor. Um, one of the one of the things we are going to talk about um, is also the fact that you are a proponent or a fan of homeopathy. Right. Um, as you told me before the podcast and um you know, homeopathy is something where I would say the the medical world always splits in two. You have the people who say, well, homeopathy is nonsense. It's sort of more like a placebo and is not really working. And then you have the other part who say, no, 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 this is this makes sense and there is truth to it. So could you, you know, walk us through to homeopathy and why do you think that this is something that should be part of medical treatment. Okay, uh, Michael, before I go into that, uh, let, me, let me correct you. Uh, my father is a lawyer. He was a lawyer. And my mom was an ophthalmologist. She was an eye, ear, nose, throat specialist. And I had three brothers. Yeah, there's a doctor. I had three brothers, uh, younger brothers, who didn't want to become a doctor. And I'm the only one uh, that would, should follow in the footsteps of my mom. So that's how it happened. And then when I went into the College of Medicine, I got to like it. You know, service to humanity and like this, you know, the cliche. But really, when you get into it and you feel the significance of what you're doing, that's, uh, so that's how I, I, I loved uh, and I continued to be. In, in the medical field, and I ended up to be an ophthalmologist. Now, uh, 
coming back to your question as to homeopathy, how I um, got into it. Actually, you know, I always uh, adhered to the, you know, teachings of my mom also and my grandparents that there are some medicinal properties in most of the herbs, you know, that uh, that we see in the market now. Uh, in the, in you know, um, some vegetables and fruits, and they have vitamins and minerals that definitely boost the immune system. You know, so if we if we take most of this in, then definitely you wouldn't you will see a big difference in your health. Really, if we do healthy living, even for the eyes alone, you know, like um, like let's say we go to ozone therapy. It has been there for for a lot of uh, you know a couple or three three decades already, but uh, most of my uh, colleagues in the medical fraternity have tended to ignore it. But in Cuba, they have shown that uh, by by doing ozone therapy, it is um, uh, curing glaucoma. You know. So, um, so it's, it's, it's very good to go into homeopathy. And at the same time, you know, we have to, I have to admit that there are some medicines also that are already good for, for, uh, for a lot of eye diseases and, and for diabetes. But if we take in uh, good supplements for the body, you know, and you will see a big difference in your, and the changing your lifestyle also. You know, I've seen it. I'm both a diabetic and hypertensive. Up to now, I am. But when I started taking these supplements, I myself can tell you, and I'm living proof, that I could control my diabetes, you know, with a good diet, with Mm -hmm. good supplements, you know, and less stress. Because stress will Mm -hmm. add Mm -hmm. to, um, to, uh, you know, uh, chronicity of the disease. And also, by the way, you should remember that 90% of the cure is psychological. I always believed in that. And 10% is only brought by the, by the medicine. You know, if only our doctors will take their time to talk to their patients, you know, they, they, they will feel really good that you are taking care of them, not only physically, but also emotionally and mentally. Some of them are already alone in this world. Some of them, um, their families are very far from them, you know, especially the, the senior citizens. In my country, we are, you know, our, our, our old folks, they live with us. But I believe that in the Western world, you know, um, most of them are living alone or in nursing homes also, you know. And I could not blame the, the, the other families because they are really busy with their work. But now with this coronavirus and everything that's happening, everybody's mind now is, you know, you have time to be with your families now. And uh, most of the work are being done at home, I believe, you know. And it's very, very good. You become closer to each other and you build relationships more, you know. And you tend to connect more with people now because you tend to miss them especially those that you don't see every day now, you know, but thank God for technology. So as I said that, um, so going back to homeopathy, I think I'm, I'm not so sure if I'm the only ophthalmologist who's doing that. I believe there are a lot of them also in, in the United States uh, who are into homeopathy also uh, together with, uh, with their practice, their clinical practice. So, I mean, what you just said, you, you, you have um, opened up a lot of topics, very rich topics. So uh, let, me, let me dissect it one by one. So do you think that the, I would say, the majority of doctors or let's say a big bulk of doctors is or was at least um, until recently ignoring the, um, the evidence and the results brought by homeopathy into medicine also because when we talk about nutrition and let's say eyes, I mean, there I cannot even tell you how many times I saw in some kind of newspaper a headline which went like this, eat blueberries, they are good for your eyes. 
you know. And then there was there was minimum of um, explanation why do blueberries uh, somehow help the eyesight if they even do. And then these these kind of headlines, if you multiply them, you know, they bring some some sort of uh, unease when you hear this information. Now you don't know well is this real science or is this is this true or is it just somehow I don't know marketing because somebody needs to sell blueberries. And I think this was a problem with homeopathy for a long time that that um, you know people felt that it's sort of esoteric and it's just you know it's like easy solutions for complex things. But I am completely with you on the side that we do not comprehend the importance of nutrition enough these days. And perhaps because of um, also the quality of foods that we are taking in, although, you know, a carrot is not the, the carrot today is probably not the same carrot that was 200 years ago due to the quality of soil and so on. So that also might play a big role. But to ask you a question, so why do you think that a big bulk of doctors was against or ignoring homeopathy for a while? I don't think that they're ignoring uh, homeopathy for a while. It is at the back of their mind, you know. Uh, but big pharma has fed us a lot of, of, of uh, you know, a lot of medicines, which they, they, they claim to be a, a real, um, you know, real cure or prevention for some diseases. It's very easy, but we have forgotten that God, that Allah has given us these natural fruits, organic vegetables for us to cure ourselves also, you know, or prevent whatever it is. Let's, let, let me tell you an example. I had a 14-year-old mm -hmm. uh, patient, okay, and she could see only six over 60. First of all, because she was always in the computer, this high technology really is, um, is uh, causing damage to our retina. So I told her to stop um, being in the computer for more than two hours a day, if not necessary, if she has to do our assignments, she has to do it, and then she has to eat plenty of fruits and vegetables. Believe me, green leafy vegetables, most especially, and carrots and beetroots and broccoli and zucchini and you name it. They help a lot because they contain a lot of antioxidants, vitamin A and, 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 and a lot of these things. And, and you, you should eat foods, foods rich in lutein and zeaxanthin also to help in the eyesight. Believe me, this 14-year-old mm -hmm. girl, after eight months, she came back to me six over six. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So I said that, you know, so I tried doing it with a lot of my patients also. I reduced their, um, their uh, time with their computers and with their mobiles and with their uh, iPads. And aside from that, I told them to eat lots of fruits and vegetables and to, shit, to stop eating um, burgers, chips, and fries only on Fridays. They can do it, you know, to treat themselves. But natural foods, they shifted to natural foods. And they even, I even uh, tell them to take a lemon with warm water, warm water with lemon uh, in the morning, 30 minutes before breakfast. And add a, a, a teaspoon of honey if they want to. Believe me, their eyesight are very good. They're, they're, the grades in their, in, in their refraction, and I refract them, uh, went down. And also, uh, mm -hmm. with regards to people with diabetes and hypertension, I noticed also that, you know, when they take 100% pineapple juice and, and, um, and, and grapefruit, the blood pressure is, believe me, it's normalized. So I said, mm -hmm. so when you take this, this soup, this, well, we could say, not say just food supplements, these are all that are needed by the body, um, Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I feel that people will just be able to prevent this chronic disease, you know. So it's really amazing what these organic uh, foods can do. Yeah, I, I see that. And um, you just mentioned that uh, also a big problem these days is the um, the technology and that we are staring into monitors wherever you go and however you look at it. Um, is this connected to this um, phenomenon called blue light and how does it actually work? Can you explain a little bit more about that? Okay. 
Yeah, blue light uh, causes really damage to the eye. We see blue light whenever we, actually, you know, um, there are, with blue light alone, we could, is a very, very broad topic uh, to discuss here. But let me just say that with the laptop, with the flickering images, but we don't really see it, you know, there's blue light in it already that damages the retina. Once we open the lights inside the house, we flood our house with blue light and we are even unaware of it. And then once you open our LED TVs, it's full of blue light. And when we go outside, I always tell my, my patients to air, always wear sunglasses. Why? Because from the, from the uh, rays of the sun alone, it will hit the hood of the car and it will go directly to your eyes, and it might cause cataracts also. So I've been warning all my patients wherever they are in the morning when they always, always wear sunglasses. Of course, you've heard of snow blindness. This is the same thing. It's caused by blue light, you know, or ultraviolet rays. Even the reflection of the buildings, the paints in the buildings, they cause blue light. Neon lights, um, the source of blue light also. We surround ourselves with blue light. So we should really be very, very careful with our eyes. Okay? Um, and there is a, a, a software which you can, um, there is something like um, an application which you can download called, called Iris, you know, in the laptop. And it will adjust the illumination of the, of the, of the laptop and it will help you, or else every 15 minutes, I always tell my patients, every 15 minutes when you are in the laptop, because most of them are working eight hours uh, with computers, every 15 minutes, you have to lift your eyes and look far in a distance for one minute, you know, then go back. Because usually when we are in the computer, you tend to stare. Firstly, you tend to stare. We forgot to blink, you know? And then um, it will also cause dryness to the eyes. That's why some people have burning sensation or tearing when they, uh, when they use the computer afterwards. And two hours, listen, listen, two hours before sleeping also, you should not use any technology at all so that you have a very good sleep because it disrupts our sleep cycle. So I don't want to get too technical but for those people who um you know our listeners who do not really know the the mechanism behind how the blue light is damaging our retina could you explain it in i would say simple way so we have an idea how this actually works well the blue light is is a very short wavelength okay that um yeah that will um reach the retina and it will you know it will um affect the retinal cells itself, you know. So uh, in it, if you are not careful, it will cause, you know, damage and burning of certain, you know, um, cells in, in, in the retina. That's how as simple, I, as simple as I can get it, you know, to explain it to the people. Okay, so, it, so there is basically a damage on the cellular level in the retina. Okay. Yeah, on the cellular level, on the retina. That's why what I was saying, going back to ozone therapy, you know, you put in ozone, ozone uh, inside your, your, your body by either by drinking it through, through, through the water, it could be done through that. Because now there's a device that is not only, ozone is, by the way, antiviral, antifungal, and antibacterial, which is really very good nowadays. You know, uh, if people just know about it. Yeah, it will replace the toxic cells in the body also. And it is also anti-cancer. You know, uh, there are studies about this. And uh, you, could, uh, you can even check it out. And um, in, in, you can Google them now. It's available in the, you know, in the computers. You can check them out if people are skeptical. But there are really a lot of studies done on ozone also. And it will be very, very relevant for us now during the coronavirus crisis situation. It's one of the answers to 
how to increase the immune system of the people aside from taking in organic foods, you know, mm-hmm. and, and, and supplements for our body. So ozone therapy as such has a, basically has a vast or a wide range of, of uses that are beneficial for our health, if I get that. Yes, that's right. So I urge our people to look through it and, 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 and see um, how it can help us during this time, you know. And I am glad that the technology is available. Uh, it's, it's a German technology and uh, the device is actually, you know, uh, it was invented. Uh, there is one that was um, patented in the Philippines also, and it's called Ozonizer 2C. Uh, and, it's, and, it, and, it's, and it's really available here in Dubai also now in the UAE. So UAE and... Uh, so actually it's not a promotion that I'm doing, but I say that, you know, what could be really good for us here. And they are coming now up with an antibacterial mask also. So a lot of, a lot of, of very, very good things are, are coming out now, you know, and um, people should be aware of these things. And uh, so that's it uh, for, uh, yeah, for homeopathy and uh, about ophthalmology also, you know. Well, thank you for bringing up all this information. Now, if we could stay um, in the topic of uh, ophthalmology for a while, um, in our talk before the podcast, you mentioned that eye rubbing um, is risky um, for, for eye health. And I, I thought to myself, what's wrong with eye rubbing? Why is that a problem? Please tell us. Okay. You see, you know, uh, there was this study in France that was done recently just to show the pe- to the people the uh, the problem with eye rubbing that it caused it. You know, you could really see the images. You could even download it in YouTube. I can give you the link if you want to. You can post it. it, it it's, uh, the, the link is there. And people could really see by their own eyes what they do to their eyes when they rub it. You push it. You push the globe. Some people, you know, um, rub their eyes so severely. And I feel I cringe. Every time I see it and I stop them from doing it because you are not only sometimes you are displacing, you know, our, our eye is shaped like a globe. And when you push it like, like, like a ball, you can imagine what you're doing with the, with the orbital contents, with, a, with, with, a, with the global contents, you know, you push the, uh, you push the cornea, you push against the cornea, you push against the, the lens, uh, you might even displace it, you know. And you can see that some people who are having keratoconus, and um, it could be a very good proof that eye rubbing has uh, has a big, uh, um, what do you call it, uh, um, that causes the keratoconus, you know, because it, it, the shape of the cornea changes. You could see it very well uh, during the MRI. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I was really amazed at, 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 at the, this technology that would show this, what's really happening inside the eye nowadays. So there is a lesson here, folks, do not rub your eyes. <laughs> Thank you for that, Dr. Joyce. Okay. Yes, yeah. If you are going, you just touch it with, either you do cold compress, if it's really feeling very, very itchy. You know, just do cold compress and it will relieve you for a while. Or else just close your eyes because maybe you have been in the computer for a long time that you have blurred vision and there's burning sensation. That's the only reason or that's itchiness when you're exposed to chemicals and a lot of things. You know, so sunglasses or safety goggles, especially in industrial uh, uh, work or job. They, they are very necessary. Absolutely. Now, um, if we go, let's say, a little bit more to a um, hmm, bizarre or rare topics, um, what would you say what was like or what is the most uncommon and maybe somehow weird or special eye condition that people have that you somehow would say is also fascinating on the other hand? Weird? Uh, <laughs> well... Okay, uh, I have confronted a lot of cases with uh, 
also, but I will not say where, except for traumatic cases. You know, I have seen one with, oh my God, with a nail inside, um, you know, from uh, coming from, you know, a carpenter was, was hammering and it went straight to the eye. Oh, okay. you know, yeah. Let me, let me tell the, the, the people in ocular emergencies, except in chemicals, you know, um, uh, chemical cases, you know, do not touch your eye at all. Leave it, just cover it and go straight to the hospital or to the ophthalmologist. Don't touch your eye, except in cases of, of uh, chemical, uh, you know, conjectivitis or chemical uh, irritants that come into the eye. You immediately wash your eyes with whatever water is available. Tap water if that's the only thing that you have. Just open your eyelids and, and you know, continuously irrigate your eyes. You know, and after that, you go to the emergency room. Don't wait for 30 minutes while going to the doctor before you, uh, before you do anything to your eyes. Immediately irrigate your eyes, whatever, um, with with alkaline things or with acidic things that went into the eye, you know, chemicals. So just wash or irrigate your eyes immediately. Thank you for another very important advice. So do not take anything out of your eye if you have something, well, some kind of object or mechanical in and uh, with chemicals, just wash it and immediately go to emergency. Okay. With chemical irritants that come into the eye, you can wash or irrigate the eyes. But if anything like foreign bodies, don't touch it. Don't rub it because you might, uh, you might either um, the, the the foreign body might even go um, more into the eye, or you might puncture the eye. You don't know, or you may disturb the orbital, the the globe uh, contents. So just leave it. Just cover it. Okay, cover it lightly, not covering it, uh, you know, tight. And just go uh, go straight to the hospital to the emergency. Um. One last thing uh, regarding the eye, and you already mentioned this uh, um, shortly. We were talking about glaucoma and in, in connection to the ozone therapy, but perhaps um, this would be also good for our listeners to know. So glaucoma is, um, as far as I know, a leading blindness cause for people usually over 60. And um, I mean, I'm no expert here, but from what I could read on the internet, it's connected to the abnormal pressure in the eye and on the optic nerve. Um, could you tell us more about that? Uh, yeah, uh, glaucoma is actually uh, increased intraocular pressure that damages the, the, the optic nerve, you know. But there is mm -hmm. also such a thing as normal tensing glaucoma, you know, wherein the, uh, the pressure is normal, but uh, the, the optic nerve is damaged and the visual field at the same time is being damaged if you do not treat the eyes with glaucoma. There are two types of glaucoma. You have the open angle and the closed angle one. The open angle people, they don't know that they had, they are having glaucoma really until their visual field is already like, you know, uh, reduced. Unlike with closed mm -hmm. angle, there will be pain. There will be redness. They will go straight to the doctor. But with open angle, unless your ophthalmologist is, is, uh, takes the, the pressure of the eye, everybody, all, I urge all my colleagues to really take the, the pressure of the eyes of, uh, of each uh, patient that, goes, that uh, goes to them in the clinic. You know, um, I remember I had one uh, case, uh, he is, uh, he's from Bangladesh, and his vision is six over six, you know. But when I took the pressure of his eyes, it's uh, around 34, 35. And then um, when I uh, did a, a visual examination in his eyes, his visual field is already very much reduced. So um, even like in cases like diabetes and, and hypertensive, even those who are newly diagnosed as diabetic or hypertensive, but you don't know how long you have had your diabetes unless you are having um, a constant uh, consultation with your, uh, with your uh, doctor, your general practitioner, or with the internet, you know. But if it's newly diagnosed, definitely all eyes should be examined. The retina should be examined. 
even kids, young kids, you know. Yeah. So, so if I understood this correctly, uh, one of those glaucoma uh, types is more of a well, let's call it a sneaky one because you don't really you don't really feel it until it's too late. Did I get that right? Yeah. Yes, that's right. That's right. You know, um, it's called the open angle type. Open angle type. Uh, okay. Glaucoma. There's no there's no pain at all. You know. And then they will be needing, um, so depending on the pressure, and, and inshallah, it will be um, controlled by medicine. But some might even need uh, surgery also to control it, uh, the pressure, the eye pressure, you know. Yeah, because uh, either, the, you know, the glaucoma is being caused by, uh, oh, especially in, in the blacks, uh, in, the, in those who are, um, um, of uh, Asian and uh, African, uh, you know, descent. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. Uh, descent yes, uh, they cause some of them are prone to having glaucoma, especially those uh, those things with, with those with, with high pigments or melanin that might, you know, uh, be in the trabecular. It's a contributing factor. Causing, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, it is. It's, it's a secondary factor, you know. This will be hereditary also. Now, if we leave now um, the eye and ophthalmology for a while, um, I also know about you that you study psychology. And it would be very interesting very interesting to me to know uh, how did psychology or the knowledge of psychology that you possess now helped you in your practice as a physician? So what would you say, what did psychology provide you additionally with in your day-to-day practice? Okay, okay, let me tell you this. I took up psychology at the time, you know, because uh, I wanted to go both into law, okay? If my father will agree with me, then I will, I can immediately shift into law from, from psychology. Okay, now, when I, when, when after I, I took up psychology and went into medicine, and then after I graduated and I was teaching medicine also at the time, I had some uh, residents or interns rotating with me. And then um, I asked them, uh, so tell me about your patient. And it really irks me when one of the residents or interns will tell me, uh, doctor, you mean uh, the patient in bed 13? I have to ask her, what is the name of your patient in bed 13? Did you even take the time to talk to your patient? Ask him how he's doing? Or did you just check his chart? Did you ask him, if, uh, has his family seen him? Or how life has been with him before? Because as I told you, 90% of the cure is psychological. When they see that you're talking to them, they feel better. And believe me, the smile on their faces. This is um, really, um, it makes my heart really, really good to see their smiles of, of why you're taking the time to talk with them, you know. I could tell me lots of stories about this where people just, <laughs> just, just break down and tell me, doctor, this is the only time that somebody spoke with me for 15 minutes and without asking about my health. You see... My colleagues, I ask them, please take your time to, 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 to talk to your, to your patients. It's very, very, you will see how important uh, it will be for them. Yeah, I think the main problem in this topic is that um, the whole healthcare has been, you know, over the past maybe 30, 40 years, trimmed to efficiency. Now, there is not much time to talk to patients if you are supposed to be maximally efficient. I think this is basically the problem. If you want to take your time and talk to your patient for 15, 20 minutes and actually, um, you know, genuinely care about his well-being, not just about blood pressure, uh, you know, um, the, uh, um, I don't know if he has all the nutrition that he needs and so on, everything that the doctor usually measures, but uh, ask about his well-being um, in general, you will probably not be able to fulfill certain certain aims that are there posed by the, um, you know, economical pressure. At least that's that's what I think. Yeah, still, still, I believe that, you know, unless you want your patient to be really, really cured inside and outside, physically and mentally, 
then you will keep on seeing the same patients again and again and again. You know, you should let the patients be uh, really happy from within. But that's how I am. Um, I, I, I could understand if my colleagues do not have the time to sit and talk and like this. But it's, it's, I feel it's very cold on the part of the patient, you know. But if you treat your patients like your grandfather, your father, your mother, your brother, your sister, your daughter, or whatever, then they will treat you the same thing. They will, you will gain more respect from your, pa- from your patients. They will love you more and admire you more, you know, for what you're doing to them. You know, you cannot exchange the, 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 the gratitude from their faces, the smiles from their faces, if you take the time to, to do this, you know. Anyway, <laughs> that's me. <laughs> if we think about or if, if we look at your, your life and, um, you know, all that you've been through, um, your experience um, in, in medicine and um, in, in different parts of your life as well, um, we come eventually to the fact that you wrote a book and it's uh, also about your life. Um, could you tell us why did you write a book? How was it called? What is it about? And why should we read it? <laughs> okay, uh, I wrote a book, Are You Crazy?, at the time when I was really, really down, you know? And then I realized that only that by sticking to your faith, having really faith and trust and respect in the Almighty, that you will be able to overcome all the struggles that you are going through. You know, um, when it comes to my career, everything was going well, you know, but sometimes, you know, uh, there comes a time in your life when you feel that um, you're not really um, doing well when it comes to your personal life. And that's when, Mm -hmm. um, you know, you make some decisions that at the time you thought were great, but then it turns out that they were wrong, you know? So um, I, it, it, it compelled me to, to, to write this book because I want people to feel what I was feeling in every, um, you know, in every moment of my life, in every stage of my life, from the time that um, it started, from the time that I was in, in my own country, a very, very successful physician, then I decided to to go uh, and um, and venture to the UAE for personal reasons, you know. So it's all in the book. Um, everybody, I know that some of the, my expatriates or even the other, um, you know, expatriates who chose to leave their own countries to find greener pastures, as they say, could relate to how I was feeling in every stage of uh, of the journey, you know. So um, there's a lot of lesson to be learned in my book, and so I hope that the people will uh, will try and and read them for the lesson that uh, would be learned from it and from the mistakes that should be avoided. You know. Well, thank you for sharing this, and um, I can only recommend the book to anybody. I can, I think they can find it on Amazon if they want to read it. Um, thank you very much also for being on the program with uh, uh, interesting ideas and and uh, you know great advice for everybody. Thank you again, Dr. Joyce. Thank you so much, Michael. I'm so really glad to be here with you and sharing these things with uh, with our uh, people. And please stay safe, stay at home, and don't worry, this will pass. Just trust God, trust Allah, inshallah. Okay, and thank you so much, Michael, for this chance. And for this episode. Bye. This was The Voice of Medicine. Make sure you tune in next time and take care.